Hey everybody, today I want to talk about short stories. For those who have viewed my channel for a while, you know that I love short stories. I think there's something magical about them. They're harder to write than novels. They can consist of just a single idea and crystallize that into a way that really sticks with you over time. So I'm going to give you five of my favorite all-time short stories. Now, I'm not going to say that these are my five favorite short stories of all time because there's so many others I could have picked, but these are five good ones, and these are five that have stuck with me for many years. Some of these I've only read once years and years ago, and I think about them all the time. They're constantly popping into my head, and they become a part of me in a way. So let's go through the five. Number five. Number five is a story called Into the Wood by Robert Aikman. I have talked about this story before in a previous video. It's in a collection of stories called The Wine Dark Sea. But this is a real doozy. This is a horror story about insomnia. And he just does such a good job of setting the mood and being evocative and creating this sort of mystery, this mysterious fear. It's a really, really good horror story. It's not monsters jumping out at you. It's, it's much more psychological than that. Uh, really creepy, it really stuck with me. I like it a lot. Number four. This is a little story uh, called Chubu and Shemish by uh, Lord Dunsany. Now Lord Dunsany, was influential to H.P. Lovecraft. He was a kind of a fantasy writer. Um, and he wrote these really weird little short stories that are just so, the thing that's remarkable about them I find is he drops you into these fantasy worlds and you just buy into it immediately. You just, you know what world you're in, you understand it and you accept the premise of the world. And they're really weird stories, a lot of them. And there's a lot of the ones I could pick that he wrote. But the one I really like is called Chubu and Shemish. And basically this story is about uh, a, a little uh, wooden idol, a god, that's carved out of wood in a primitive hut. And he's fairly happy ruling over these people, that they worship him and they give him offerings of oil every day. And then they introduce a second little wooden idol, uh, which is called Shemish, to the, <laughs> to the hut. And he just becomes overwhelmingly jealous and petulant and arrogant. And it's this struggle of power between these two insignificant little wooden idols that are worshipped as gods. Um, and I don't know what it is about this story. It's kind of funny. Uh, I think it says something about the human condition, but I'm not quite sure what. But it's just something that stuck with me for a long time. And the, just the, the idea of this hubris and this arrogance and this pettiness and this overwhelming uh, sense of self-importance of these little uh, statues carved out of wood, uh, something about that just sticks with me. And I think it's a really fun story. But all his stories are great. You should read them. Number three. This is a story by Shirley Jackson. Uh, I've talked about Shirley Jackson before here. Um, she wrote these really interesting kind of slice of life stories. She's primarily known for The Lottery, which is a horror short story. This one's not a horror short story. It's just a little slice of life. And it's not usually the kind of thing I would like. I usually like genre fiction a lot better. Um, and there's not much of a plot to this. I like plot driven short stories. But this one really stuck with me and I, I've been thinking about it for a long time about why. Uh, the, basically the plot of the story is these two little boys, one is black and one is white, are playing and they go into the white one's house and the mother is there and she's giving them lunch and she's talking to them and she keeps trying to offer help to the black kid. She keeps saying, oh, well, you can take some leftover food home with you. Uh, you can take some leftover, some of my son's hand-me-down clothes with you, you know, trying to be real helpful and nice. And the, the kid is confused by it and he doesn't get it. He's like, my father's a foreman in a factory. We make plenty of money. If we need food, we go out and buy it. If we need clothes, we go out and buy it. I have all new stuff, but thanks anyway, but I don't, need, I don't need any of this stuff. I don't get why you're acting this way. And this goes on for a while, and she eventually gets angry and kind of storms out of the room and is upset that she's not able to help the kid. And then the kids kind of shrug and look at each other and are like, what was that about? I don't know, and go off and play. Um, and I think this story is about this kind of subtle, it's the tyranny of low expectations, right? It's the subtle racism of thinking someone needs help when they don't. But I think the reason it really stuck with me is it plays into this idea that this woman is, is using charity not because she wants to help someone else, but because she wants to make herself feel good. You know, charity is not about, I've always been suspicious of charity. Um, it's not really about the other person, it's about making yourself feel good or look good. 
And when she's denied the opportunity to do that, she gets angry about it. She's not happy that the kid is doing well and that his father makes plenty of money, and that he doesn't need hand-me-down clothes. You think she'd be happy about that. She's annoyed by it because it robs her of the ability to put herself in a position of superiority and kind of exert power over them by giving them things, by helping, you know? So I think that's why the story resonates with me so much. Um, it's just a great story. It's so, and it's so subtle, you know? She never, she never comes out and says what's really going on. It's all just revealed in the actions of the characters. And uh, it takes some analysis and some thinking about to really get it. But I love that story. It's one of my all-time favorites. Number two. This is a story by Arthur C. Clarke. I find a lot of my favorite short stories are science fiction because they're so plot and idea driven. You can come up with a really clever idea um, and make a great short story out of it. Harder to do with a novel. Uh, and this story is called Second Dawn. And I don't know why I like this story so much. It's a, basically the story is about this race of uh, essentially horses. They're four-legged hooved animals that have over millions of years acquired intelligence. And they're about as intelligent as people, possibly more intelligent than, than people. And they live on the planet of their own. And most of the story is about uh, them trying to interact with their environment and figuring things out because, because they have hooves and not opposable thumbs and fingers, they can't really interact with their environment. They can't change things, they can't build things. And as a result, their intelligence has developed very, very slowly over millions and millions of years. It's taken them much longer than it would have taken us to develop intelligence. Um, and at the end, they encounter this race of uh, very primitive but very rapidly evolving monkey-like creatures that have hands and fingers and opposable thumbs, and they kind of form an alliance with them to try to advance together. Um, but I love the thought experiment. I think the thing I like about it is this idea, what if you had, uh, this idea of asking what if. What if you had a race of creatures who couldn't interact with their environment? How would their intelligence look like? How, what would they learn to think? What would happen? Um, and the idea that so much of learning comes through experimentation and through playing with things and tinkering with them with your hands. And that's how you get to a higher level. I, I just love that thought experiment. It, it, something about that story just touches me deep inside and I, I think about it all the time. Finally, number one, uh, maybe my all-time favorite story ever. It's by Philip K. Dick, another science fiction story. It's called Paycheck. Now, they made a movie out of this with Ben Affleck. It was really bad. Don't go see it. Uh, read the story instead. It's, it's an amazing story. It's so clever. This is an example of the type of cleverness that I wish I had and that I, can, I can't even imagine how someone would go about writing this story from scratch. The plot of the story is that uh, this engineer has gone to work for a, basically a time travel company. Um, and he has signed a contract that says they're going to wipe his memory after he works for them. He's going to work for them for a year. Then they're going to wipe his memory and he'll get his payment. And so he won't remember what he worked on for, you know, proprietary secrets uh, for that reason. So at the beginning of the story, he wakes up after his year of service, doesn't remember any of it. He goes to get his paycheck and instead he gets an envelope full of junk. It's like a broken and half poker chip, a piece of wire, uh, a card, just like a torn a ticket stub, just garbage. And he's like, what is this? I, I was going to get paid millions of dollars. Why am I getting an envelope full of junk? And they show him a contract that he signed while his memory was erased that said, I waive my pay in favor of this envelope full of items. And so he has to figure out what's going on. And this is, you know, I'm going to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it. So turn it off now if you want to read it. But what happens is he was working on a time scoop, which is a device that can reach into the future and pull items from the future back to the past. And he had basically seen while he was working there that the company was planning to rip him off and he found a way to uh, escape them. So the, like the police are coming after him and he uses the, these things, these apparently useless items come in handy, very specifically handy, one at a time over the course of the story. And not only does he escape getting caught, but he actually manages to wheedle his way into a partnership in the company and make tons of money because he was able to foresee all this beforehand and find the, the exact right item he would need at the exact right time. It's so cleverly plotted. It's just a work of genius. And so many of Philip K. Dick's stories are like that. I think he's a complete master storyteller. Uh, he has the most clever ideas I've ever seen. And I think this is my favorite short story ever. So there you have it. My five short stories that will stick with you and you will remember and you should definitely read. Um, this is not rule out other short story collections that I will give you in the future. There's lots of other short stories I could have put in here. Because uh, it's a, like I said, it's a style that I really like and I'll really uh, continue to read from different authors. But that's it for now. I've been Logan Albright. Thank you for watching and I'll be back with you next week.